Um, it is truly my honor and pleasure to be able to introduce my PhD advisor and the person who made this fantastic conference possible, Dr. John Patience. Uh, Dr. John Patience is a professor emeritus of applied swine nutrition here at Iowa State University. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Guelph and his PhD from Cornell University. Dr. Patience is a global leader in swine nutrition research and an outstanding mentor to his students and colleagues. He has dedicated 46 years to the swine industry and his research has addressed dietary electrolyte balance, water quality, amino acid requirements and metabolism, ingredient evaluation and general feeding management, uh, of wean to finish pigs. And most recently, his attention has turned to energy with a particular focus on carbohydrates and fat and on the opportunities that exist to exploit the functional properties of ingredients in order to improve pig health, performance, and well being. So, over the course of his career, he has recruited over $50 million in external funding, published more than 150 papers seven books, and more than 800 other articles. He is an internationally awarded researcher and speaker, and his numerous awards include a fellow, being a fellow of both the American and Canadian Associations of Animal Science, and he was honored with the John Swisher Award by United Animal Health, and was made an honorary master pork producer by IPPA. And luckily for me and many of us in the audience, John says his greatest enjoyment is training grad students for futures in both academia and the industry. And John's passions outside of work include his family and grandchildren, hockey, of course, cyclone sports, genealogy, and photography. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Patience. Well, thank you so very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about a subject that is relatively recent in my research career, but uh, we've really uh, enjoyed getting into fiber and how this all evolved back in the day, as Nicole kind of alluded to, we were doing a lot of amino acid research uh, when I was at Prairie Swine Center. And as we got to understand amino acids better, we came to realize that maybe we're not applying the knowledge that we have in amino acids if we don't understand energy better. So in other words, if the knowledge for amino acids is here and the knowledge of energy is here, we're, we're, we're missing out here. So we switched from amino acids to energy. Um, and then as we looked at energy, energy's different, right? It's not like amino acids and minerals and vitamins. Uh, if I want to study lysine, I study lysine. If I want to study calcium, I study calcium. If I want to study energy, I kind of have to study starch and oils and proteins and so on because there's four different sources of energy in the diet. And so when we broke it down that way, we thought, I think we understand starch pretty well. I think we understand amino acids or proteins as an energy source but we are really lagging behind, especially the Europeans when it comes to fiber, and there were some issues with respect to fat as well. So we focused on fat and fiber, and now we've, uh, we've uh, focused in exclusively on fiber. And part of what's driven us on fiber is the fact that we know we're gonna be using more and more fiber in pig diets in the future, and partly because we know that we have an opportunity to favorably affect the health of pigs uh, by selecting the right kind of fiber and the level of fibers to put in a diet. So in other words, diet formulation is switching from exclusively a focus on nutrients to uh, when we look at, at ingredients, we're now also looking at the functional properties of those ingredients. So we can formulate diets to be equal in nutrient content and not get equivalent performance and that's really frustrating, of course. And in part of the answer to that, there's different answers, but part of the answer to that is the functional properties. What do ingredients bring to the party when we include them in the diet formulation? So the objectives then of my presentation today is uh, 
I got a screen over here. I don't have to turn around. Ah, darn new technology. So one is an understanding of what fiber is. Before I started I, uh, putting my talk together, I talked to some people in the industry and said, what would you like to know about fiber and what do you think your colleagues would like to know? So I'm going to talk about, well, what is fiber really? What are, what's the best assay for fiber? That seems to be a big question with a lot of people. What assay should we be using? I want to talk about the negative effects of fiber. I want to talk about the positive effects of fiber. And then I want to end up and talk about fiber, nutrition, and physiology going forward into the future. Here's a fun fact that I came across. Um, I, I can't attest that it's true because I didn't measure it myself, but it sure makes for a good story that one gram of cellulose has the same surface area as the footprint of an average bungalow between 1,000 and 2,000 square feet. Isn't that amazing? One gram of fiber. No wonder it's such a son of a gun for us to understand because when it gets into the intestinal tract, it has the ability to do so many things. So what exactly is fiber? Well, we can use different definitions of it, and I'm going to go through a number because I think that's helpful. But Overall, taken all around like a donut, fiber is the non-digestible portion of the plant cell wall. Now that's not 100% complete, but I think it's a pretty good fi uh, a definition to work with because there's constituents of the contents of grains which are fibrous in nature, but it's primarily in the cell wall. Now the site and degree of digestion of fiber depends on a number of factors. Uh, for one is how are the sugars, how the sugars are linked to each other will affect digestion. So glucose is a really valuable sugar for us. It's a big part of how we acquire energy. But if those sugars are linked with beta bonds, one four bonds, enzymes can't break them down. So that doesn't really provide us with a source of, of glucose in the diet. But if they're linked by alpha, linkages, then we can use them. So that linkage is really, really important. How these carbohydrate molecules, so when you link these sugars together and get carbohydrate molecules, how they're linked to each other also plays an important role. And in, in uh, cellulose and hemicellulose, for example, hydrogen bonds are really important. Well, if you think back, uh, for some of us a long, long time, Back to freshman and sophomore chemistry, hydrogen bonds aren't very strong. But if in the, as in the case of cellulose and hemicellulose, you have enough hydrogen bonding going on, it can become pretty dang strong. And that especially is what's going on with cellulose. And then there's other constituents of the fiber around cellulose and hemicellulose and how they link together and this thing called lignin that we include in fiber. It's structurally, it's different, but we include it in fiber. And you put that all together, and that creates a structure that just is not conducive for the pig to digest it, right? And that's what we're dealing with, and that's what we're going to talk about. And in addition to that, then there's all these other factors, like the age of the pig. Are we ad-libbing the pig or limit-feeding the pig? There's a big difference in how the sow will use fiber just based on whether she is being ad-lib fed or limit fed. Okay. So, taking another look at fiber, and this is, to me, this is one of the most important points about fiber that we have to deal with. And um, it's, I think it speaks to the frustration that we all have with fiber. We can talk about fiber and define fiber in physiological terms, i.e., all plant polysaccharides and lignin that are resistant to hydrolysis by endogenous secretions of the gastrointestinal tract. And physiologically, we're really interested in what those, uh, those polysaccharides do in the intestinal tract. It's a functional thing. But chemically, we define fiber basically as the sum of all these sugars, the sum of all these non-starch polysaccharides <coughs> 
oligosaccharides, and lignin. And put those all together, add them all up, and that's fiber. And we can analyze that reasonably well. And oh my gosh, has there been improvements in the last 20, 25 years? And so chemically, we can define fiber quite well. But here's the dilemma. This is one of the things that I, I suggest you really keep in the back of your mind when you're talking fiber, is there's the, our ability to analyze from a chemical point of view and our ability to define the physiological effects of fiber. And they're not the same. We use chemical analysis to get us as close as we can, but it doesn't get us all the way there. And that becomes one of our frustrations, certainly become my frustration. So carbohydrates we can also define as um, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and, uh, and oxygen that are typically joined together in sugars in a ratio of one to two to one. There's this thing called total dietary fiber that uh, has become a much more accepted definition of fiber both in human nutrition and animal nutrition. There's this thing called non-starch polysaccharides, which has also become a popular way of analyzing fiber. And I have a, a bit of a preference for NSP or non-starch polysaccharides over TDF, and I'll explain that in a minute. And NSP can be defined really as the soluble sugars plus the insoluble sugars. Put them together, and that's total NSP. And if we take the total NSP and add lignin to it, that gives us TDF. So they, that kind of definition, that chemistry, works well for us because they fit well together. So a few, more, uh, a few more words on terminology. Sugars we typically refer to as mono and disaccharides, so glucose and lactose, uh, very simple. And, um, and, uh, and so when we're talking about sugars, that's typically what we're referring to is one or two molecules uh, polymerized put together. Oligosaccharides then are um, three to nine sugars linked. And you'll sometimes hear the terminology three to nine degrees of polymerization. And what that really means is just three to nine sugar molecules linked together. And then we have polysaccharides, which is anything more than nine, and to a huge number, thousands, depending on the carbohydrate that we're dealing with. So, so you can see there's different ways for us to kind of define what fiber is and how we look at it and how we understand it. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about cellulose and hemicellulose because they're such important parts of fiber, especially to those of us that are feeding corn-type diets because they're a big chunk of corn fiber, right? So cellulose is constructed, these 1,4 linkages, they're, uh, they're beta linkages of glucose, all, all glucose, different from starch. And as I mentioned before, that's important. Cellulose is, is uh, insoluble in water in most organic solvents, non-folded, very strong hydrogen bonds just by virtue of the numbers. So it establishes a very firm structure and uh, strengthened by connections with other components of fiber like lignin. So if you get a picture in your mind, you've got cellulose molecules and you've got some other sugar or related compounds and you've got lignin and you've got hemicellulose and you put that all together with them bound together and our enzymes don't do a very good job of that, right? So therein lies our problem. Now, there's a huge number of celluloses out there. We talk about cellulose, and I have to admit, I was a fair way into the whole issue of fiber before I realized that cellulose really should be celluloses, because when you talk about cellulose, you're not talking about a single entity. Uh, as they say here, there's there's a huge number of celluloses out there. Um, wood and cotton batting, those are, those are heavily uh, cellulose. Cotton is 90% cellulose, wood is uh, 40 to 50% cellulose, and an awful lot of lignin. And uh, so wood cellulose, there's 300 to 1,700 glucose 
polymers linked in the, in the cellulose of wood, whereas in cotton, it's 800 to 10,000. So keep that in mind when we're talking about cellulose, we're not talking about an entity. We're talking about a category. And that, there's a lot of similarities within that category. And in fact, in my experience, um, I would say that celluloses generally act, in, in our experience in, as nutritionists with food products, celluloses kind of act like cellulose. Now when we get into, but I want to leave the message that cellulose is not a single entity. And please keep that in mind, that's a really important message. When we get into hemicelluloses, things change a little bit. Hemicellulose is different. Um, it's still largely insoluble, like cellulose. But I notice I'm saying now largely. Not insoluble, but largely insoluble. And its structure is much, much more diverse. Uh, much more branching and, and so on. Many more sugar types that are involved in hemicellulose. Cellulose contains glucose, where hemicellulose contains some five carbon sugars like xylose and uh, arabinose. I'm hoping this is bringing back memories, uh, Nicole, right? And, uh, but also six carbon sugars like glucose, mannose, galactose, and so on. So you can see hemicellulose is quite different from cellulose. And the polymer chains can range from 500 to 3,000 units. So once again, hemicellulose is a category, it's not an entity. However, when I said that cellulose kind of acts like cellulose acts, hemicellulose is much more diverse and we can't draw the same kind of conclusions. Uh, this, this hemicellulose did this, so all hemicelluloses do this. That's not the case. And this was, this was an interesting finding of Nicole's work when she, we thought, well, gee, if, there's, if we're dealing with hemicellulose so much, and if we break it down, if we do get enzymes that can break hemicellulose down into individual sugars, can the pig even use those sugars? So is that xylose available uh, only for fermentation, or can it be used directly? And what Nicole found was it can be used directly. In the literature, you would find, generally speaking, that xylose is not well used by the pig, hardly used at all. But if you look at that research, they used very high levels of, of xylose in the diets that they fed, and way beyond what the pig would ever have been exposed to from an evolutionary point of view. So what the, we think what happened was that really overwhelmed the capacity of the pig. And so in Nicole's work, she used lower levels of xylose and did find that it is well used by the pig, but nowhere close to as well as glucose, but it can be used as an energy source. So if we can release xylose, the pig can use it. Probably everybody in this room has seen this diagram. And I love this diagram on one hand and I hate it in another. And I love it because it does what science should do. It takes diverse information and puts it into an easily understood package. That's what we as scientists should be doing. But by doing that, sometimes it has uh, misled us or caused us to misunderstand things. But just to go through it very quickly, quickly. Um, so we have the cell wall component and the cell uh, constituents. The cell wall components are largely here. So the lignin cellulose, hemicellulose that I just referred to, and those tend to be um, insoluble. So insoluble dietary fiber measured here. And similarly, NDF. So one of the problems with the NDF assay is it only picks up insoluble fiber. It doesn't uh, account for any of the soluble fiber. Then the pectins, the gums, the mucilages, and beta-glucans, they are more uh, soluble. They're picked up and part of soluble dietary fiber. And so they have a better chance of being fermented and used by the pig as an energy source. So, if we use the detergent system and we analyze for NDF, we're picking up lignin cellulose and hemicellulose as a, as a single entity. 
If we add uh, ADF, then we're picking up cellulose and lignin, so the difference between NDF and ADF is hemicellulose. So a relatively inexpensive way to estimate the amount of hemicellulose that exists in a feed ingredient or a diet. And we can further go further with Pete Van Su's system and analyze for acid detergent lignin. So we can take ADF minus acid detergent lignin, and that gives us cellulose. And so I'm not saying those are the best ways to analyze those components, but they're certainly effective and for most of our purposes in nutrition, quite adequate. But we're moving more and more to systems like total dietary fiber, which is the sum of insoluble and soluble dietary fiber. Or we're looking at non-starch polysaccharides, which sum together includes everything that we've just talked about except lignin. So remember, as I said earlier, NSP plus lignin equals total dietary fiber. So that part of it kind of fits nicely. But we've got this thing over here called resistant starch. It's not a huge part of the diet, but it can be three to 5% of the starch in a diet can be resistant, and what that means is it's not well digested by endogenous enzymes, so it therefore starts to act like a fiber. So it leaves the small intestine, gets to the large intestine, and then it gets fermented. And of course, fermentation isn't nearly as efficient as, uh, as digestion, so we would prefer not to see that. But then we have all our other carbohydrates over here, which are the cell contents and includes things like starches and disaccharides and other things that are important in the diet as well. So let's talk a little bit about, spend a little bit of time talking about soluble versus insoluble, because that's an important component as well. It refers to solubility in water. And since the intestinal tract is an aqueous environment, that's not a bad way to analyze it or evaluate it. But it's a chemical as opposed to physiological way of looking at things. Um, but it includes lignin, celluloses, hemicelluloses, and some resistant starch. The physiological effects, well, they're, it's a fairly substantial list and an important list. Uh, the hydrophilic nature tends to increase fecal bulk, so insoluble fiber does a pretty good job of working as a laxative. Uh, it speeds intestinal transit time. So that has some benefits in terms of trying to get rid of pathogens. The insoluble fiber kind of moves things along. It also has abrasive effects. So when the, uh, the enterotoxigenic E. coli are trying to adhere to the epithelial cells, there's this sort of um, grinding effect or abrasive effect, and this insoluble fiber tends to reduce that. And if they can't adhere to the epithelial cells, they can't inject their toxins and they don't have near the effect on the pig. Um, insoluble fiber discourages the proliferation of pathogens because it doesn't ferment very well, right? And uh, it delays glucose absorption and it also delays the hydrolysis of starch. So, um, so it has some positive physiological effects and it has some negative ones. And so if we look at common ingredients, I'm just giving you a list to give you a sense of, well, what's, what kind of levels of insoluble versus soluble fiber do we have? These numbers came from a number of publications, uh, a number of labs, good labs doing good work, but there's a lot of variability, okay? And that variability can come from different labs, use different assays. Uh, it could be that they were dealing with different substrates, different wheats, different corns, et cetera. Uh, so, for example, soybean meal, um, I saw references where the soluble, the level of soluble fiber in soybean meal ranged from as low as 10 to uh, well over 20%. Uh, so there's that variability. Um, but uh, these are all very respected labs. Um, one of my handiest references is Neil Jaworski's from Hans Stein's lab. He just he must have spent an awful lot of time in the lab, Hans, right? <laughs> he did a lot of fiber assays. So, uh, but that gives you an idea. So we're looking at, any, oops, we're looking at anywhere from uh, 80 to 92% insoluble fiber in these ingredients. And you're gonna see some very familiar looking ingredients there. 
What about soluble fiber? Well, again, it's solubility in, in uh, water. Uh, it includes then the pectins, the beta-glucans, the mucins, the gums, etc. Some hemicellulose, but probably practically speaking not that much, and most resistant starches. Tends to be fermentable, but we're going to talk a little bit later on. We cannot equate solubility to fermentability. We'll get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we do that. Okay. Um, so it tends to be fermentable, depends on composition. Uh, what differs is the rate of fermentability. The physiological effects, well, soluble fiber gets fermented in the lower intestine, in the ileum, and then in the large intestine and cecum. In, or soluble fiber tends to slow the rate of passage through the intestinal tract, uh, and it slows gastric emptying, and it also slows gastric uptake. And it also uh, modifies the microbiome because many soluble fibers are also fermentable. Uh, I'm just good. So here is a list of some ingredients that shows what level of solubility. And here we see from uh, slightly less than 30 to 40 percent soluble. But here's just uh, I put one example up here just to remind me to point out. So rice highly soluble fiber, except there isn't very much fiber in it. So we can't really call it a good source of soluble fiber because there just isn't very much present. Now, if you're looking to increase the level of soluble fiber in your diets, these are some examples that might be available. Uh, citrus pulp is 70, over 70% 70 soluble. Chicory roots, potato pulp, hullus, uh, oats, tofu residue, any residue that's put on my, or any tofu that's put on my plate will be a residue at the end of the meal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then sugar beet pulp. Uh, none of them tend to be very inexpensive, so that's a bit of a problem for us if we want to use them practically. So coming back here, just to remind us about what these assays are, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step onto some really thin ice and I'm going to give some recommendations on the assays that I think make sense for you to use as swine nutritionists, practical swine nutritionists involved in day-to-day -day diet formulation, as well as what I think researchers should be doing. But I'm going to say, and there's an awful lot of fiber people will disagree with me, but in our part of the world where we're dealing with largely corn and corn co-products, which are largely insoluble, if we're just doing routine work, like quality control, or just want a sense of how much fiber's in the diet, I don't see a problem with using NDF, as long as we keep in the back of our mind that it's ignoring soluble fiber. But NDF is routinely available, it's relatively inexpensive, and so it makes sense from a practical point of view with that one issue that we need to keep in the back of our mind. The other problem is, is that there's a lot of lab-to-lab -lab variation. So if you're going to do NDF or have NDF work, if you don't do it in-house, you want to deal with a lab that will be very, uh, one lab that you're comfortable with what they're doing. Now, if you're developing a new feeding program, say a diet by health interaction, then my choice would be NSP and lignin. And the reason for that is when we do NSPs, we know the sugar content, and sometimes those sugars are really important. So for example, oats. Oats is, has a great value in human nutrition for lowering cholesterol. Well, it lowers cholesterol because of the beta-glucan. And if we don't, if we just do an overall fiber analysis, or even soluble versus insoluble, we're not going to pick that up. So if we're doing any development of new programs or evaluating new ingredients, I think we should do NSP and lignin or TDF. And I'm sure there's folks in this uh, room will disagree with my recommendation, and that's fine. That's what makes science work. But I think we can stay simple when we're doing simple things and we only need to go more complex when we need that extra information. But just keeping in mind, I was talking to one person who, um, who does do a, a TDF, for example, and just the consumables for the TDF assay are $40. So it's, a, it's an expensive assay to use for just doing routine work. But 
if we're doing research, if we're developing new knowledge for you to apply in the field, NDF isn't close to being good enough. We have to move to either TDF or NSP. Negative effects of fiber. <clears throat> Um, there appears to be little difference in fiber digestibility between gestating sows and growing pigs if we're talking about soluble fiber, but there's a big difference if we're talking insoluble fiber. Fiber um, reduces energy and nutrient digestibility. Here's some data from Chad Pilcher's thesis, and you can see the reduction in amino acid digestibility with 25% DDGs all the way down. Um, and obviously that's not a good thing, but it gets worse. As you know, I have, I'm a great fan of trying to understand energy. And what this slide shows us is there's the four sources of energy in the diet, lipids, starch, uh, and fiber. We don't have protein up here, sorry. And it shows that if those fat sources are being used for lipid deposition, these in green is the efficiency with which the pig uses that energy source. But if they're using that energy for ATP production, so that's maintenance or protein deposition, then these are the digestibilities that we're working with, and they're very different. So number one, we need to know where the pig's getting the energy from, and then we have to know what the pig is going to do with that energy. And so here, um, Amy Petrie put this together uh, for me for a for talk uh, a couple years ago. And if we formulated a diet with 20% DDGs and let energy float, what happens is then NDF goes up, carbohydrate goes down, fat goes up a bit. But what, look what happens to net energy contribution to the total. So the diets are approximately the same in total any content, but the amount of energy, net energy coming from protein went up over 15%. The amount of energy coming from fat went up 25%, and the amount of energy coming from fiber went up 54%, although there's not a lot of NE coming from fiber. And by the way, we think we're probably underestimating the, the fiber component here. Uh, it's kind of hard to do this calculation, um, but maybe for insoluble fiber, we're maybe not too far out, but if you had soluble fiber in there, we're probably out by quite a bit. And the amount of energy coming from starch is down 12%. So when we go to changing our diets, even if we formulate to an equal energy content, we need to keep in mind, ooh, ooh. we need to keep in mind that this is what's going on. And no energy system right now tells us this. We just have to have that in the back of my, our mind as we're trying to understand how energy is being used. Here's, an, here's another example, and I'm gonna have to pick up the pace here, sorry. Um, this was a study that Monica Newman did, two samples of higher energy corn and two samples of low energy corn, and they were, um, this was back in the year of the drought, uh, was that 2012, somewhere in there? And you can see there's about a 4% difference in energy between these two samples and these two samples. If we look at energy or dry matter digestibility at the terminal ileum, there's no difference. Digestibility of those two of those four corn samples didn't change. But there was a tremendous drop in the amount of energy released by fermentation. That's not going to show up in a, in, a, a, in a normal estimate either. So this change in energy occurs in, in the large intestine, not in the small intestine. And that has implications for how efficiently the pig uses energy. So fiber reduces energy intake. And I am going to skip through this, sorry. I don't want to take the time. I'm going to skip through that one too because I want to get to some positive things about fiber. <laughs> yeah. So if we look at insoluble fiber and what it does from a health point, point of view, how to do that, wow. We can see that it, as I mentioned, increases passage rate, so it lowers pathogen proliferation lowers non-digested substrates, it lowers protein fermentation, and you know, protein fermentation in the lower gut has really negative impacts on, on the health of the gut. We just don't want that, especially in the newly weaned pig. So that improves gut health, and it can also 
uh, improve bacterial growth fermentation depending on the nature of that insoluble fiber. If we look at soluble fiber then, we can see that it improves fermentation and bacterial growth, both in the lumen and in the mucus layer, and in the epithelium, it has positive effects on anti-inflammatory markers. It has positive effect on, on um, uh, epithelial barrier integrity. Uh, Dr. Chin Yun Lee, that was the session chair earlier this morning, showed that in, in one of her studies really well. Um, and so there's a lot of positive things that come with soluble fiber. And so our thinking at this point in time is, is that soluble fiber is desirable in the newly weaned pig because of these positive effects on physiology and gut. But there's a real problem if we have too much protein getting to the large intestine because it ferments and we're putting a fermentable substrate with that protein, and that's gonna make a bad situation worse. So we're thinking, if I was still gonna be able to do research for the next five or 10 years, one of the things I'd wanna pursue is can I, uh, um, re by reducing the amount of undigested protein that gets to the lower gut, but increase the amount of fermentable uh, substrate that gets to the lower gut, can we have a positive impact on the health of the pig overall? And I think that's true, but that's just based on the, looking at the literature and I haven't done the work yet. So that, ooh, I am having trouble up here, aren't I? I um, so soluble fiber added to sow diets lowers the level of activity, so makes those sows seem more satiated. Uh, Dr. Teal showed some really cool data today about fiber uh, right around the uh, uh, farrowing period. Um, and we've talked about improvement in gut health. Um, here's an example using inulin, that when inulin was added to the diet of these pigs at 8%, it reduced the number of scour days, it improved feed efficiency, and it reduced ETEC or enterotoxigenic E. coli shedding. So these soluble fibers can certainly have a positive effect. Chin Yung, in her work, Negative control, pigs that weren't challenged with E, with e. coli. Uh, positive control, they were challenged. Soluble fiber, uh, so challenging those pigs with E. coli, lowered average daily gain. Um, adding soluble fiber, improved average daily gain, as did insoluble fiber. But looking at diarrhea incidence, the insoluble fiber made it worse the soluble fiber was about the same as the uh, positive control pigs. Looking at E. coli attachment, um, soluble fiber reduced it substantially from the, from the positive control. So we think there's some real opportunities with using soluble fiber in the diet. So where do we go from here? We will need to br bridge the gap between what we can assay and what we want to know physiologically. That's a real challenge, I think. And we've come a long ways in the last 10 years and we'll get a lot further in the next 10 years. While fiber poses some serious challenges, it also offers some valuable features that we should be taking advantage of. Fiber will become an increasingly important tool for us to use to help the pig deal with health challenges. I really believe that. And we will be formulating diets. This is speculation on my part, but I, th I think it's true and there's more support for this speculation, okay? That in the future, we're gonna be formulating diets to achieve a specific ratio between soluble and insoluble fiber. And that ratio is gonna depend on the health status of the pig, the age of the pig, some of the other production objectives that we have, but that ratio is going to become very important. And then to, in, to achieve our goals in terms of soluble and insoluble fibers, I mentioned before, I think we're gonna have to bring protein into the equation. And remember, in, when we do crude protein measurements in a diet, we measure nitrogen and multiply it by 6.25. About 20% of that nitrogen is not protein, right? It's non-protein nitrogen of some sort, nucleotides and other things. So we gotta keep that in mind. We're gonna to have to become a little more sophisticated than that as we move to this level. So with that, that's, uh, that's my gang. Um, and as, uh, as uh, Nicole said at the start, I love doing research. I love my extension role. I love my colleagues. 
uh, both at, at uh, Iowa State, but also at, at other universities that we collaborated with. But this is kind of what got me out of bed in the morning, and, and it's, so, it's, it's such a pleasure for me to have them back here uh, for this meeting today and tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll try to answer your questions. All right, thank you, John. We have time for some questions now, and again, uh, we'll toss the microphone to you, and please then speak your question into the microphone. Uh, okay, there you go. Uh, I was, uh, I've been curious about and confused about the E. coli response with the insoluble versus uh, soluble fiber. Do you think it, the, the um, you know, most, you talked at the beginning about insoluble, you know, being positive for removing the, the for helping move the E. coli out of the system. Do you think the difference in your trials is, is associated with the age of the pig that was used or, or what are the reasons why you got the best benefit with soluble fiber when some of the other arguments has been using insoluble fiber for that. Thanks, Mike. That's a, that's a really good question. And we've thought a lot about that issue. And I think there's a number of answers to that. And I think um, that, and, and by the way, just you know, for full disclosure for people here, if you were to talk to Europeans, they would have just cringed at what I said about soluble fiber for the newly weaned pig. Right? They just don't believe that at all, and they look at our data and just don't believe it. And, uh, and so I have great respect for that, because they've been doing fiber a lot longer than I have. Um, and so I think there's a number of things. I think our feed ingredients are different, Mike, and I think that plays part of a role. Yes, our pigs are at a different age than, than their pigs are. Um, I have to say, you know, the work that we did was pretty intensive work with uh, challenge studies, small number of animals, very intensive, allowed us, to, allowed us to measure a lot of things, but that's one of the things that I, I retired to early on, is I didn't get a chance to take it to the field and see what would happen out there, and I'd really like to do that. But I also think it's this ratio between soluble fiber and insoluble fiber, and I also think it depends on the nature of the soluble fiber. I don't know because I was rushing if I made that point well enough, but soluble fiber isn't soluble fiber and it really depends on the sugars that are involved or some of the compounds like beta-glucans and so on that are involved. And the Europeans use very different diets than we do. It's kind of like they come up with a very different lysine requirement for the lactating sow than we do. And their data is great. And our data is great, right? But there is a difference. And, and I, I think to your point, if we could understand that difference, we could understand that science very much better. Thanks for the question. John, thanks so much for your presentation and especially for your influence in the industry over the years. Question to, as a follow-up from your fiber presentation. We all know that for effective use of fiber, pelleting is an important component of that. We know that pelleting likely improves the digestibility of fiber components. Is that enough to change the net energy or ME values of those diets containing fiber, both for the gestating sow and the finishing pig? Yeah, yeah good question. And, and yes, the, you know, there's, there's a number of op options that we have available, Steve, to improve the digestibility or utilization of fiber. And one of them is through the use of enzymes. Another one is through the use of, of um, uh, physical processing like pelleting that you've talked about or extrusion. Um, I, I'm going to use my question time to make one point that I didn't have time in my talk because it relates to what you're saying. Um, one of the things we find, you find, you guys deal with all the time is when you add fiber to the diet, a fibrous ingredient, the pig will try to eat more and more feed, uh, as shown here, until it gets to a point. So energy is going up this way. So as energy goes down, feed intake goes up as the pig tries to compensate and eat more feed to maintain energy intake. But they get to a point where they just can't eat enough feed anymore. So energy intake, uh, feed intake plateaus, and uh, net energy intake then goes down. But I'm not sure we've asked the question adequately as to why does this happen? I think we all assume that this 
phenomenon happens because the pig has a limit to its physical gut capacity. And as we add fiber to the diet, the diet becomes less dense and the pig gets to a point where its gut just cannot accommodate any more volume. But what we haven't considered is that um, as we increase the fiber content of the diet, the pig eats slower. Right? We kind of forget that. And if the pig's eating slower, then all of a sudden we're possibly putting more pressure on feeder access because the pig needs more time to eat than it did on a low fiber diet. And maybe as we go forward, if we're going to have to feed a lot more fiber in the future, maybe we're going to have to, to uh, give more feeder capacity to these pigs so they can spend more time and maybe they can increase feed intake at a, to an even lower level of net energy. That trial, that study needs to be done. We know they eat slower. What we don't know, the, the, the experiment hasn't been done, is if we give them more feeder space, will they be able to eat more feed and therefore maintain energy intake? So thank you for asking that question and allowing me to go back to my slides, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Uh, the doctor patient, my name is Wan Tai Hong from the University of, of Minnesota. I know some of the researchers encourage us to focus on the physical chemical property of dietary fiber, like focus on the viscosity of dietary fiber, focus on the fermentability of dietary fiber, because not all insoluble or soluble dietary fiber generate that property. Yes. So what's the, your opinion like, um, we should move on to analyze those physical chemical property instead of focusing on the insoluble dietary fiber content or soluble dietary fiber content because that didn't tell us what it, what it happens in, the, in our digestive yep. system, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question as well. And I, and I agree with you. And it also is one of the reasons why I prefer the, going the NSP route rather than the TDS route because as we understand the sugars that are involved in the soluble versus insoluble sugars, we can start to get a sense of whether with viscosity, for example, is going to be an issue. But talking about physical uh, characteristics of the fiber, we can get into water holding capacity and ionic strength and, and those kinds of things. So, so I agree with you that those are uh, important and, and you guys at Minnesota have done some work recently on viscosity. And so I, I hope you keep going on that because I'd like to see, you know, uh, is the viscosity issue um, something we need to be concerned with in the current kind of diets that we're feeding or is it only something we need to be concerned with is if we go to different ingredients in the future that gives us even greater levels of viscosity. So to answer, simple answer to your question, I could have used a single word and that is yes, we should be looking at that as well, for sure. Right, so your question, just so the guys get it on the camera, is that the, uh, you're saying we, we still have to develop some of the methodology to have um, consistency across how we do these analyses at different labs, because otherwise we might confuse people. Right, and, and I'm thinking the, that's why the industry hasn't, hasn't done it. Hasn't yeah. Done it. yeah. But you know, to a certain extent, what you just described even applies to measurements of NSP and TDF, doesn't it, right? Because there are so many, when you look in the literature, if you look at TDF assays from 10 years ago, you're gonna have a different result than if you did them two or three years ago because the methods have changed. So you're, that point is also very good. Thank you. thank you so much for that. All right, let's thank John again.